Here we go, part two. All right, guys, just to get this second part started, I wanted to show you an alternate pretender creation. A couple people mentioned in the comments that they'd like to see alternate pretenders, and I'll show you a couple things that I've used in my testing and play games. I created an attempt at a bless that was fairly reasonable, and we still have order one, productivity one. I went with cold one. I went with neutral growth instead of the three growth that we got with our life-based pretender, and plus one luck and minus two drain. I didn't feel much pain from the drain as we had such good access to skull mentors owl quills and dreamstone so this didn't feel too bad three times attack skill was great for a repel build it helped a lot with our blessed troops expanding shock resistance is really good when you start spamming out lightning with your femorian druids two times reinvigoration is good for virtually all of your femorian kings and your femorian giants low light vision helps if you run into darkness i had a player stomp me with some darkness this helped a lot with it enchanted blood made it so our big fat guys never bled to death because that happened so many times that I swear it was intentional by Ill Winter. Blood Surge helped increase their killing power greatly and awareness made it so we weren't punished for having less troops in each battle than they did. Now, if you guys remember, with the bonus attack skill, our Fomorian Giants weren't really what I angled the Bless for exactly, but it helps because three attack skill puts this up to 14. We have length four weapons with 14 attack skill, and it made it so we were able to repel a lot. Now, these guys I didn't use too much because their lack of hats until I had research to be able to cast spells like Airfend and similar things, Fog Warriors, etc. But these guys were phenomenal. We didn't need the Healer Pretender because even in my other video, I preferred the Fomorian Warriors, which barely ever came out with afflictions, and I like the Nemedian Warriors. Nemedian warriors. But if you look, an unmarked and a Nemedian warrior can fit into the same square. And what I found in blitzes in particular, shorter games rather than longer, is the growth three that we took didn't really help a lot. It didn't make much of a difference. Heck, I couldn't even expand my dominion that well in a competitive game that fast. And so instead of running with Fomorian warrior in a square along with a Furbolg warrior in a square, I went with a, an unmarked in a square along with a Nemedian warrior. And what this gave me the advantages of was I had magic weapons in each square that did solid damage with good attack skill and they have a length three weapon so they got decent repels themselves and then i had unmarked with 15 attack skill 24 damage and good repels and with their high defense and good repels they were really good against a lot of monsters that i was otherwise getting stomped by and with the blood surge and the attack skill bonus i actually ended up making these guys killy enough that i could buff their protection throw fog warriors on them do a bunch of things to make them actually compete even with van hairs not early i needed the research to compete with van hairs but it made it so it was actually survivable instead of just getting rolled over by every van hair army i ran into so it was fairly effective go ahead and try that out and we'll talk more about alternate pretenders in the future with other nations as there are quite a few different choices and i'm pretty creative with my pretender choices i like to mix things up quite a bit i just up until this point have been showing you what i feel is the most optimal so it's easier for people to get into but we'll start having a little section where i go over alternate alternate pretender choices so you guys can have a little fun with this stuff. <laughs> All right, guys, here's an example in one of our multiplayer games where we got bumped by a loaded... We lost our profit in this one, too, but we had the new Bless. The reason that I like this new Bless so much is because it gives us a chance of surviving against things like Floods of White Centaurs. Now, we get beaten because we're facing, like, 16 White Centaurs, and we only have five Sacreds, and we... This is our second battle of the turn, so we obviously have lowered hit points and other things, so we're not going to be very tough in this battle. We're, we kind of got an unlocked lucky bump and if you're fighting two battles in one turn your troops don't heal in between the battles as you can see so we ran into a bit of an issue and we lost all of our slingers on the last fight but you can see how much our guys put up a fight if you watch this closely because these centaurs should slaughter us and they do But you can see we did quite a bit of damage. And if you're looking at the centaurs, we're hitting them for solid damage despite their protection. And our attack rolls are getting pretty high up there. And that's just a quick example of the fact that even though they had 14 white centaurs, which is a big investment for them, we only had five unmarked and we were able to take out six of them and a centaur warrior. We did pretty solid in this battle just because of that. Even though we got completely bump screwed in this blitz, it still worked out pretty well for us. So you'll see more examples of them holding their own against other other super troops in the future.
Hey guys, just wanted to show a quick little intro to the way that these matchups line up between Fomoria and Vanheim. We are in a pretty bad setup in this game, and I wanted to show you a battle between my commander, Chazzy Burger here, the YouTuber who I always recommend checking out. It's a strong Fomorian king, doesn't have anything going. We're not too far into the game, but we have a large enough army to kind of cause a problem for most people here. We have the Fomorian warriors lined up with the Nemedian warriors. But the problem is when you see when we're against Huskarls and we're against Van Hairs with Luck and undying you'll watch how fast we get chopped up into pieces just to show you kind of what the basic setup is this will be the basis for why we need to spam spells later to try to take advantage now we have the advantage of being able to research air two mages a lot faster than they can or at least for a lot cheaper so in this game we had a bunch of castles building yeah they just destroyed us we had a bunch of castles building fomorian druids in mass and a couple of these turn files i have saved i'll load up and i'll show you guys the differences that happen in a multiplayer game when you script spells to try to reverse bad fights and similar things so we'll keep an eye out here's an example a good example in how to react to a steamrolling vanheim player if you remember van hairs absolutely slaughter our troops or at least our giant troops easily they have high defense and mirror images and the old strategy used to be to pop their glamour with slings because in dominions 5 if you hit somebody with glamour and it did any damage to them it would cancel all of their mirror images which completely countered mirror images since mirror images only work against melee the archery would ignore it hit the van hair do a point of damage and then it would drop all their mirror images so then you could chop them up in melee combat however in dominion 6 that's been changed that no longer works so let me show you here I have an example. This is not a battle we're going to win, but it's just an example. We have a bunch of Nemedian warriors because they have higher defense. We're hoping that their magic weapons and higher defense will help them out a little bit, but we're going to get slaughtered in this because all of these guys have mirror images. Our decent damage troops require attacking in melee combat, so they're going to be completely countered by that. And I'm showing you an example here where slings and archers don't work anymore. Now, archery still counters mirror images in the way that it ignores the images in Glamour, but if you don't have have high enough damage with a crossbowman or something similar you're not going to be able to punch through what's the protection on these guys 13 and then when they get a natural protection buff of say seven from bark skin or with vanheim it would be earth so it would be iron skin so it'd be what 13 they're not they're going to ignore your arrows and then they're going to get berserk five and they're going to completely ignore your arrows so let me show you an example just in case some of you didn't know that slings no longer pop glamour arrows none of that This will be the best example right here. Now you look, a bunch of these guys took damage. This guy took a couple points of damage. He got hit in the, he fell off his mount for seven points of damage, my goodness. And he still has images, two mirror images present. So as you can see, even people that are getting hit, like this guy, here we go, hit mounted herdman with a range attack in the arm for five points of damage. That would, in Dominions 5, that would have canceled his mirror images. However, this doesn't do anything. So now when our Nemedian warriors have to encounter them in melee combat, they still have all their mirror images. And you can see we're not even chopping through the mirror images at all. We're still being countered by these guys. And again, even without any protection buffs, which Vanheim is notorious for, they're going to have the Berserk buff, which gives them protection of 19 on the head and 16 on the body. Your arrows aren't going to do anything to these guys. So just be aware, when you have these 24 and 26 damage guys with attack of 19 and 18, even your Nemedian warriors with their defense of 17 are not going to be able to avoid being hit. They're not. They're going to get thumped and crushed just like they're going to in this battle. Look at that. So as you saw, archery no longer counters mirror images. It still works because it's not fooled by the images, but if you don't punch through their protection, it's just as ineffective as if it didn't work. So when we analyze the bless of Valheim here, we have to pay attention to the fact that they took a bless to counter hopefully our thunder strike, good poison resistance, fire resist, cold resist. They took a generic bless. I've used this exact bless myself in multiplayer games, so I know it's effective. Blood surge gives them extra damage, enchanted blood, that one's new, but it gives them essentially a little bit of regen and poison resist, so now they have 10 poison resist. There's really no battlefield wide spells that do low damage that you can spam them with to knock them out, which makes them very hard to deal with. You'll notice they don't have magic weapons because now that that's an incarnate bless, that's harder to take. 
take. But the thing is, with these guys with high protection later on, you're going to have to find a way to deal with them. We need to attack something that all human nations are vulnerable to, like armor negating evocations, or we can spam spells with high base damage, like Thunderstrike, to eventually punch through their protections, because Thunderstrike does higher base damage, so it's going to ignore the 10 lightning resist. They may not be stunned by the lightning area of effect, but they're it's going to punch right through that 10 resist. Let's go check an example of that out. All right, so now I've set up a battle against Van Hares. We have a couple Javelinists, so hopefully pop some Glamour, because 22 damage will, it, it'll whiff. When we get Storm up there, Precision will be something like two. But 22 damage might punch through the Glamour and actually knock a few people out. We've got our Nemedian Warriors over here. A couple of them are injured because I accidentally got them diseased, but not too many. And then we'll have our Air 4 cast Storm, and then True Shot Warriors, hopefully on the Mages, so that their Precision doesn't go to negative 18. And then we'll Thunderstrike these guys and see how this works. So let's see what's going on. That's not optimal. There are supposed to be on hold and fire. That's okay. Maybe they'll break up the formations enough to make it effective. There we go. See, these guys are getting popped hard enough. Thundershock, five points of damage, shock damage. That's stunning them, which helps us a lot. Breaks up their formations. Okay, they got back to our mages. That's not optimal. We know that's not optimal. So that messed up our test a little bit. That's okay. We'll see what happens. We'll see how well they respond. It sort of formed a cocoon around our druids. Let's see what happened here. Thundershock for five points of damage. Ah, so it takes the away from the damage roll. Very nice. Okay. Not bad. We're getting them with the Thundershock now. Thunderstrike. Yep. Once we have them compiled up like this, you can see the advantage of Thunderstrike. Once they're jammed in like this and not able to chop through us too fast, we have a lot of damage we're doing to them. This is looking much better. We've even got some of their herdmen to retreat. This looked much better, even though we clearly lost. So we still lost, but we got the majority of their herdmen and a bunch of the Van Hairs. Okay, now let's try out doing this, but with illusion spam. Let's replace a few of these druids with a few Nemedian sorceresses that can drop illusory army and see if that helps. All right, so we saw evenly matched armies, even though I don't think that's very realistic in terms of a multiplayer game. Even armies, Van Harris chop us to pieces. Even with a few Javelinists to try to pop Glamour and not pop Glamour, but do damage with ranged attacks, which ignore Glamour. We're still dealing with basically these dorky troops. I'm trying to show that like with a suboptimal army, we can win with equal money. The money on both armies is virtually equal. In fact, I think, I think they're ahead or we're ahead by like 20 gold. And we brought gems to show the difference. So what we're going to do, our strategy here is you can see they don't have spirit sight, at least not until they get blessed, but I don't think they have it either. They couldn't afford it. So they don't have spirit sight. They don't have true vision. So we're going to, what we did was we removed a few druids, and we added in two Nemedian sorcerai designed to, I just gave her extra gems because I didn't want to calculate it out, two Nemedian sorcerai that we brought to cast basically twilight into nightfall so it becomes dark. That way the Van Hairs will lose three attack rating on their attack skill. Now, some of these Van Hairs have three levels of experience, so they're a lot better than normal, but it doesn't really matter. I kind of ignored all that. But we're going with a nightfall into twilight strategy with one of our sorcerai, and with the other sorcerai, we're spamming illusory army for one gem each. It gives us 20 soldiers that are ethereal, and those troops will run out and essentially slow down the Van Hairs from chopping up our Nemedian warriors. What we're going to do is spam that thunder strike in the background because we know that's the major way we're going to do damage this fight. We're not going to be able to punch through tons of damage with only 17 damage on our weapons. So we know our thunder strike has to deal the majority of the damage. And then what we're going to do is have the illusory army summoner cast basically blurred warriors. I forget what it is battlefield wide, but it's basically blurred warriors to give the Van Hairs who attack us an additional minus two to hit. So since the darkness gives them minus three to hit and the blurred vision gives them minus two in addition to that, minus five, which against our Nemedian warriors of the fence, it'll drop to 16 because they only have 50% dark vision, but that will make it so that they're swinging with an attack roll, an average of say 13 to 14 plus five for their berserk, 18 to 19 minus five back down to 14 against defenses of 16. So that gives us a way higher chance of them surviving longer, which allows our druids to spam their thunder strike. So let's see what happens in this battle. There's our first illusory army. These little guys run out ethereal. They're an illusion, no real hit points, but as long as they're able to avoid being hit with non-magic weapons, they should be good to go for at least long enough to delay. There we go. First volley of Thunderstrike. That seemed effective. It stopped a bunch of them. Or they started shooting. 
Alright, the Nemedian warriors split to prevent the ambush of our mages by this cavalry. Thank goodness. Although we are wide open over here. But you see, now that it's dark, the attack skills minus three for the darkness, so they're down to 11 for berserking. And then you'll see down to an attack skill of 11 or 12 before berserking. And then in addition, our troops all give them minus two to attack skill. So that's treated like a nine or 10 against our 16 defense. Now our sorcerer and I are spamming horde of skeletons because that's what they tend to do after scripts are over. Let's see what happens when the Van Hares come and get our mages here. A little more Thunderstrike to hold them in place. I think that knocked somebody off their horse and stunned the horse, so it's blocking people from getting through. That's excellent. Now the skeletons are starting to stop them. Okay, Nemedian warriors cleaned up the herdmen. More skeletons to keep stopping them from punching through. A little more Thunderstrike. A little more Thunderstrike. One or two got through. Look how brutal these guys are to deal with. My goodness. 24 and 26 damage, but still attackable. Only 15 and 14 versus our 16 on our Nemedian Warriors. It's going to be close. But that's one hell of a change from what happened when we tried to solve our problem with just troops, isn't it? There we go. Equal gold, equal money against a super blessed Vanheim with units that, first of all, counter our entire nation to begin with. And with equal amounts of gold, equal investment, we took a few extra gems, but they brought super blessed tons of sacred troops and we were able to eke out a win. And there we have it. All right, guys, there are many ways to skin a cat. We know that illusions are not mindless, so they can fall asleep. Spoiler alert. But what we're going to do now is we replaced essentially two Nemedian Sorcerai for every three druids to keep the cost the same. So the armies are still equivalent and cost and then we gave them a gem to drop illusory armies in the beginning to give us a quick buffer that has ethereal on all of the troops so that they can get chopped up a lot longer by these guys before they get ripped apart and then what we're going to do is spam i think it's called gift of dreamless sl slumber or something like that it's a cloud that puts everybody to sleep in it and it actually has a decent chance of hitting people because it leaves a lingering cloud of sleep so it hits them over and over and over and over until they fail their magic resist check and then they're unconscious so it breaks up their formations it breaks up their ability to fight well in lines or groups depending on how they're set up and let's see how it goes there's our illusory army there's the nightfall and the storm see we've already broken up their formations in a big way of course when they fall asleep their defense goes to zero which makes it really easy to thump them And now here come the undead spam at the end with the sorcerer. Undead are mindless, and because of that, they're immune to things such as sleep. The Van Harris really did not like being slowed down and falling asleep. Neither did the herdmen, but you see the difference? Our army is now just taking over the side with the herdmen on it making it a much less fair battle for these Van Hares. And even though the Van Hares are very tough, we can now spam them and slowly whittle them down since their stats are lowered by the Nightfall. And then we'll start throwing some evocations in there towards the end to hit them. Hopefully, anyway. But you see we're just whittling them down. And now it's really hard for them to hit this defense of 15, defense of 16, when these Van Hares only have attack skills of 11 and 10, when they're not Berserked, when they are Berserked, they get all, and let's see, Blood Surge and Berserk. This guy has a 19 and 18, so still it's higher than our 16 defense, but it's not infinitely higher, so it's still actually decent for us to survive a little longer. Very hard for a Van Hare army to punch through this. There they are evocations that just completely whiffed but you guys see the difference instead of focusing on dominions five strategies where we're trying to pop their glamour with slingers and then try to beat them up with troops if you face a troop like van hares that are just obviously ripping through your giants try something with your spells you have such good magical diversity on Fomoria, at least in terms of combat spells to deal with this sort of problem and other than that your troops are outstanding to be able to handle other things
and wanted to show you guys a disgusting little multiplayer trick I was tinkering around with with Fomoria. So a lot of times when you're dealing with nations with a lot of cavalry, such as Soramadia, they can recruit these lancers in every province without building a castle, without anything, and these things thump you. They have two attacks, obviously. They're horsemen. They have all the advantages of horsemen. You know, good morale, good combat speed, high defense skill. They can run across the battle and thump your troops. So Soramadia can get these going in massive, massive, massive numbers. In addition to the fact that they're Oyeropata, I think is how you pronounce it, have spirit sight, so they're hard to ignore with something just as simple as ethereal on your troops. They have jade lizards that hit like trucks. They have the Oreopatas that often have good blesses. But there's one trick that I use whenever I see a large army, and we're looking at this from Sora Madia's point of view because I wanted to show you after the battle exactly just how devastating this trick is. But there's an old trick that you use with a spell called Winds of Death. Winds of Death basically withers everybody on the field, so they start to age rapidly and they decay and they fall apart. And there's an old trick where you basically build a ring of returning, you know, magic penetration items like a rune smasher or a spell focus or a shaman staff, any of the magic pen items that you can get to make winds of death more effective. You put them on a mage with a ring of returning and the ring of returning makes sure as soon as they take a point of damage, they go back to base. However, Fomoria does not have good astral access. In fact, we don't have any astral access, right? So my version of that is I look at these Fomorian kings and I say, hmm, this guy happens to have heroic toughness. He's super tough. He rolled a death random, so he has three deaths, so he can cast Winds of Death with gems. And if I twice born him, when he dies, he'll come back as a white mage, which is a huge death mage, super powerful, and essentially this upkeep of 270 goes to zero. It's a really easy and dirty way to get your Fomorian kings to be free to maintain over time. And the good thing is they become even more formidable as super combatants once you turn them undead because then they lose their melee encumbrance essentially and they become super hard to deal with. So what I happen to do is I take this guy. The other problem with Winds of Death is that you can't catch the army. It's hard to guess where the army's going because you really don't want to cast Winds of Death when your own army's there because all of your own army will wither as well. So what you do with Fomorian kings since they have high air, they're able to to cloud trapeze onto a province. And if you remember in Dominion 6, heck, all Dominions, the magic phase happens before the combat phase. So you can cloud trapeze yourself onto a province. For example, if this giant army assaulted one of my bases, this is a big army that's tough to deal with. But what you can do is you can take one of these gentlemen, cloud trapeze them onto the province, and before this army can even move away, this battle will occur. And what we do is instead of ring of returning ourselves back to base, we don't want to build magic pen items because if we did that and we died and used twice born, we would lose those items and they would gain those items. That's too big of a loss. So instead what we do is bring a couple extra gems to make sure we can overcast Winds of Death and get it off at least twice. And Winds of Death, not only will Winds of Death target these guys with only a 10 magic resistance, but look at that magic resistance of the horses. Five. And if they fall off their horses because the horses died, then they take, you know, anywhere from one to seven damage. They take DRN damage when they hit the ground and that can really mess up their cavalry. So let's take a look at how this goes. Let's see what it looks like just so you guys can see how effective it is. There's the first one. Now you see all the numbers popping up. That's everybody that's been decayed. And you can already see people falling off their horses. There's a second Winds of Death, and I believe that puts us unconscious, right? Yes. So he's not going to get another one off, but you can hear the sounds of them dying. Look at the effectiveness of this. Now look at... Oh, there you go. Now, the reason that happens at the very end is because anytime you have a duration going, such as Winds of Death, when the combat ends, the duration doesn't just end. It keeps going. These Oropatas have good resistance to everything. They have decent undying blood surge spirit sight. They're pretty tough to beat in this battle. But as you can see, all their death spam, everything, we managed to hit all of it with that Winds of Death. And let's take a look at what it looks like after the battle. Look at that. So out of 311 troops running around with 171 lance or 69 cat a bunch of archers and oreopatas. You see this 112 we lost, but also 46 because they lost their mounts. 17 lost their mounts, 14 lost their mounts, three lost their mounts. Here's the thing. If you go to this province now and you look, we have a total of 52 units in this province. So we're at 16, 9, 25, 32, 36 troops left over. 36 troops left over if you don't count the commanders. 36 troops left after 311 troops because one Fomorian king teleported in and caused all sorts of problems for us. 
in one turn that can't really be avoided. You can avoid it by using anti-magic, but that's about it. And a nation like this doesn't have great access to anti-magic. Might be worth it to them, but now they have to be prepared for it because it can appear anywhere at a moment's notice. And now looking from the Fomorian perspective, as you can see, the same battle happened. He cast Cloud Trapeze, he got in the fight, and then he lives again as a white mage. He carries over his heroic ability of toughness. Look at that HP. Tell me this isn't a super combatant. It costs nothing per turn. That is a super, super combatant. This guy can go around and cause lots of problems as a super combatant for you. So this is something that I would definitely abuse as Fomoria because you have one of the best giant mages that are capable of doing this and abusing this to stomp people in multiplayer. Because if you're doing this, look how many of these guys can do this. These guys are capable. This guy's capable. This guy with an extra gem would be capable. Extra gem. You could give them a skull staff and they'd be capable. All of these guys are capable of it. You could even do it with a Nemedian Sorcerer Eye if you wanted to, but I don't like being chucked by a random arrow. And since their death is usually only two and their air is usually only one, it's very hard because if you get death three, then you still have air one, so you can't cloud trapeze. And if you get air, then you only have death two, so it's really expensive to cast this. So that's what I'd recommend. Abuse these Fomorian Kings because then that 270 cost they normally have turns to zero and you get these monstrous white mages and you can run around starting to convert yourself into a whole bunch of death. And with this guy, if you get up to Soul Vortex, and with this guy, if you get up to Soul Vortex, cast this on yourself, it does damage to everyone around you. He can become a super combatant. Soul Vortex, invulnerability, throw some armor on him. This guy can become a real force to be reckoned with. So just remember that and try it out. Also, just a quick note, sometimes when your Fomorian King dies from twice morning, he can increase his death by one. So just keep that in mind as well as a bonus. And just as a final note, I ran it with two Fomorian Kings just to see what the results would be. And it was just as devastating as expected. Every single troop was killed except for the Hydras and most of the commanders died as well. I can show you a quick rapid run through of this one as well. You'll see how many are affected. That's a double cast now with two Fomorian Kings doing it. demolished and the best part we killed the rock but if we go to this province now and look total of 9 10 11 troops survived and this guy's missing a head i mean this winds of death strategy is disgusting try it out it's a really good one All right, wanted to also give you guys a quick little example of raiding with Nemedi and Sorcerer. Give them two gems, and heck, you probably only need one gem. And what I have her do is scripted to cast luck on herself, personal luck, and then cast Illusory Army. And you can see we're going against a decent province defense of Soromadia. I believe they're at six or 11. I think they're at 11. That Yeah, that looks like 11. And it's a decent province with Jade Maidens and Amazons and their chieftain, their Lancer chieftain. But we're able to take it with these stealthy Nemedi and Sorcerer. She has so many mirror images, but um, she's able to come in here and just cast Illusory Army and watch how effective it is at taking this province defense out, which makes them very frustrating to deal with. There's her personal luck, so she doesn't get one shot by an arrow. And there's the Illusory Army. Now you look, her fatigue's only 54, so she's still good to go. She can cast it again. But either way, these guys are ethereal. So they'll be able to resist most attacks and take out most province defense before they get eliminated. See? And here comes the slow ethereal troop destruction of 11 province defense. And in multiplayer, most of the time you're dealing with province defense of one, if they don't care about the province, six, if they're early in the game and just kind of preventing random bad events, and 11 if you're running around late game. So this illusory army followed by hordes of skeletons just makes these Nemedi and Sorcerer able. And with that, you're allowed, you're able to go to 20 different provinces with one sorceress in each province and take them all at once and do perfect elf raiding. In addition to that, you can throw a mix into it with some Nemedian warriors and a Nemedian Sorcerer where they run in and take out heavier province defense. Like if somebody's trying to catch you with a small army, you can have her cast different spells like just spam and horde of skeletons, try to take over a little small size army. So try it out. And finally, another example of a late game spell for Fomoria is called Dance of the Morgans. We have a little tiny force here, just a couple of our sacreds and our pretender running around with a bunch of gems and a Fomorian king casting darkness. So he's scripted to cast darkness. He's scripted to cast Dance of the Morgans. And then I think afterwards he's doing Wailing Winds to put fear in the hearts of those guys and a little province defense. And this massive army would obviously stomp all over these two. But let's check out what happens with Dance of the Morgans. Morgans, if you remember, take our bless. And as long as you have a way to cast Divine Blessing later on, or if you have a level 3 Holy cast in it, there's our Darkness. Reduces everyone's attack and defense skill. There's Dance of the Morrigans now. And now you'll start to see these Morrigans appearing on the edge of the battlefield and warping in to fight. There we go.
See all these Morgans running around here? These ladies have Spears the Morgan. They should be blessed. I don't know why they're not blessed, considering our pretenders right here. And it says they're always blessed in their own dominion. They also bless all troops that accompany them into battle in their own dominion. And you can see from the morale, we are in our friendly dominion. So he's showing blessed. The Morrigans, however, are not. So I don't know if that's a bug with Dominion 6 or what, but... Unmarked are all blessed. Morgans are not. That's interesting. Regardless, they just swarm into battle. There we go. Morgans are blessed now. So maybe it's just taking time. Maybe it's... I think what it is is it's every turn it checks if they're blessed or not. And then it blesses them if they're not. Yeah. So that's what I think is happening. Okay. So now that our bless is actively working, look at these Morgans just keep appearing and appearing and appearing. You see how many there are? All of these take our bless. And all of them fight like monsters with their life-draining spears. And they keep regening themselves and healing themselves and lifting off and flying and slaughtering. You can see how many there are. This is a very overpowered spell. If you're looking for a way to counteract this spell, there's really not much of a way to counteract this spell. The thing that basically counteracts this spell is the... Yeah, we came with 31 troops and killed all 309. So the thing that basically counteracts this spell is just the fact that it's really hard for you to be able to cast it. If you have a pretender who can build a skull staff, then you can put it on a Fomorian king and have them do it. But it's still four death gems and 400 fatigue to cast. So you really can't play around with using an extra gem just to get it done. But that's Dance of the Morrigans. That's definitely why you want to use that spell. That is a win-all spell at the end. So keep that in mind if you ever get yourself in a final pitched battle that you need to win. But my personal opinion, just throw that Winds of Death trick on them twice before the battle and then come marching in with, you know, just a couple random lightning bolt casters and you should be good to go. And just to end the video, don't forget, guys, we're working on the Fomorians to get the part two out of the way just because we did our old format. But our new format's going to be more of a beginner mode for the first video so I can crank those out much much more quickly and then that'll help with expansion and basics of how to play the nation that way you guys can get started playing the game against some ai and also against some lower level beginner games because i feel like multiplayer games are the best way to teach yourself but i know some people are uncomfortable with that so the beginner videos will start helping people figure out how to get a handle on the nation what they're supposed to do what they're supposed to feel like how they can play them and then when we get to the advanced tactics we'll throw in some more specific things like our winds of death trick here for Fomoria and similar cloud trapeze anti-thug mechanics and similar things like that. But I wanted to get this video done with in a way that gave you some tools in multiplayer that would work. And waiting for my actual multiplayer games to finish so I can put them on here just takes too long because I don't feel like it's right of me to put players' turns out in public until the games are over, even in blitzes and similar things. So I tried to isolate where you could see what games they were and who was in them just so I wasn't putting anybody out there. But in the future, I'm going to try to set up example battles and things as opposed to taking turns from my multiplayer games games to show exact examples unless I get permission ahead of time. So we'll see you guys on the next one and let me know down in the comments which nations you'd like to see on the next video.